Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to continue this series, Crazy Love, what we started last week. If you weren't here last week, we uh, looked at how the Bible defines love. And so anybody remember like one thing, part of the Bible's definition of love, that love is or is not? Anybody remember? Love is not easily angered. That was one. Love is patient, kind, not selfish. If you missed that, you can catch up on our YouTube channel. Tonight, I want to talk to you. Uh, I want to give you a warning, and it says, do not disturb. Some of you guys might want to put that on your door before you go to bed. So you, in case your parents forget there's no school tomorrow or Friday or Monday, do not disturb, right? Well, when we're talking about this, um, this crazy love, when it comes to love and dating, that warning basically is saying, don't wake somebody up too early. Don't be the person that ignores a do not disturb sign. I hope tonight that you'll see it's okay to wait on a relationship. That's kind of the main point that, that I hope you, you take home tonight. In fact, it's best if right now you decide that you don't need a relationship to define you. How many of you guys know the person that they are defined by their relationship? They're, they're, they find their identity in their boyfriend or girlfriend, right? Leslie, you're looking at Carlene. I don't. Nope. Okay. Just check him. Let me just say it's the only ra- the, the relationship I would encourage you to focus the most on right now is a relationship with Christ because that's a relationship that will make an eternal difference, right? And so the big problem I see is that many students are willing to put aside a relationship with Jesus to pursue a relationship with a guy or a girl. This year marks my 15th year working with students full time as a youth pastor, 15 years. So how many of you guys are 15? I started doing youth ministry when you were born. How many of you guys are not yet 15? I was a youth pastor before you were born. So that's pretty, pretty crazy. But in that 15 years, I've, I've had a lot of students come to me and say, hey, I'm dating so-and-so and, you know, we're, we're going out or whatever. And and usually my first question is if I don't know this person, if they don't come to our youth group, they don't come to our church, my first question is, do they love Jesus? And too many times the answer is no, but they're really great. They're really, they're really cute. They're really nice. And the problem is that we're going to talk about this more next week. The result of, of settling for a relationship with a non-believer is that your relationship with Jesus is usually the, the one that takes a back seat, right? You, you focus more on that person than you do on walking with the Lord. You trade something eternal for something that's over and done in a few months because that's kind of how most relationships go at your age, right? A few months and that's it. But before we look at the warnings not to disturb, I want to give you the big picture reason for what, why this is important. And, and this is your number one on your fill-in. It says this, God's plan for relationships is marriage. God's plan for relationships is marriage. Did you guys know that God invented marriage? It's not just an idea that we came up with. The, the relationship that's to be enjoyed between a man and a woman was invented by God. And according to God's definition of marriage, marriage isn't to be between two men or two women. That's our society's idea, and it's the opposite of God's plan. This agenda is, is being, in fact, if you watch the Super Bowl, all of Coldplay's performance was designated to the LGBT, the, the lesbian, gay, bi, and transsexual community. Was All those rainbows were all, were all for them, right? And then the rest of it was given to the Black Lives Matter movement and a lot of social division. So there's, there's a lot of social problems, but that's a big agenda that's being pushed in fact, it's hard to watch a commercial on TV without seeing that agenda come through, even in something like a toilet paper commercial. It's like two dads picking out the toilet paper or something. You know, just, it just comes in subtle ways. But if you don't look at, your, at the Bible, if you have your Bible, if it's on your page, it'll be on the screen. This definition is found in Mark chapter 10. It says this, uh, Jesus is responding to some people, and he says this, but from the beginning of creation... He made them male and female, talking about God made us men and women. Verse 7, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. In verse 9, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. 
So from the beginning, God created men to be with women and women to be with men. And God's design is that as men and women have relationships to each other, they get to know each other, that will draw them towards a state of being married, starting a family, that the children born out of that marriage will then be raised seeing a loving mother and a loving father, and they will learn how to, have, uh, how to interact with the people of the opposite sex, and then they will eventually grow up, mature, meet somebody, get married, and this cycle continues on and on. And that's how God intended it from the beginning. That's why he says, you know, what God has joined together, let no one separate. God's plan is that a man and woman get married, and they stay married until they die, right? Uh, we really get this messed up a lot in our world, but I know a lot of you guys are a long way, or you should be a long way from marriage, right? Most of the people in this room that are in school, you're a long way from marriage. I think back to when I was your age, there's no way I was ready for marriage, right? I think of even going to college, and I thought, yeah, I could get married, and then, nope, four years of college, I still wasn't married. And, you know, I had to start into my adult life a couple of years before I... Um, well, Mel, Mel and I met when I was still in college, but before we started dating, I had already been living on my own for a few years, and then it was nine months after we started dating that we were married. Well, I guess about a, oh, nine months, nine months. So it was a, we knew each other for a long time, and we decided that we, were, we should be married. So um, that's just how it was. But, you know, the, if that's the case, you know, if, if me, I was 25 before I got married. So if you're 15, that's a whole decade before, you know, that point comes. So why, why should you be thinking about it right now? It's because if God's plan is that one man and one woman commit to him and to each other for their life, and you think that your idea is that I should just date whoever I feel like, and if it doesn't work out, I'll break up with them. You're practicing for divorce. You guys see that? If you're jumping from relationship to relationship, boyfriend to boyfriend or girlfriend to girlfriend, you're practicing for divorce because you're getting into this idea that if it doesn't work out, then, oh, well. I don't have, they have a ring on their finger, right? I'm not married to them, so I can just let it go. Well, that's just practice for divorce. You're getting used to saying that if it's, if it's too hard, then I'm going to give up on it. Right? And that's not the way that God intends it. God's plan for relationships is eventually they lead to marriage. Now, you don't get it right every time. I dated a few girls before I married Mel. Right? There, there was a few of them. But I found out real quick. Here's when I was at, by the time I, I, had, I had one girlfriend in high school, off and on for a few years. In college, there was a few different girls I, I dated. But <laughs> when it came to the point that if I'm getting to know this girl and, and we're hanging out and we're going out to dinner and stuff, and I, I looked at her and I said, could I be married to her? Could I spend the rest of my life with this girl? If the answer to that question was no, that relationship was done. See, there was this change in my mentality that said, if I know God's plan is that one day I will be married. And if I can't see myself being married to this person, then there's no purpose in me pursuing a relationship with them. So I don't want to practice just divorce. I don't want to practice giving up. But verse 9, God says, what God, Jesus said, what God has joined together, let no man separate. So that tells me that if I really want to operate and, and, and see the best fulfillment of God's plan, for relationships, then I should stop trying to find the person in my own strength and say, God, until you bring that person to me, until you show me the right one, I'm going to be content in my singleness. And you avoid a whole lot of heartache. You avoid a whole lot of just things like, I can think of a number of relationships. I, I didn't treat girls the way that, I, I was a jerk sometimes. I'm still a jerk sometimes, but I, we work it out, you know. <laughs> but um, I'm just going to be honest. Guys, we're jerks sometimes. But I think of uh, the fact that there, there might have been a girl that 
I dated, and I knew that we weren't going to, I knew I, I couldn't see myself marrying her, but I didn't want to hang out by myself at dinner in the cafeteria. So string that relationship along a little bit. That, that was wrong, right? You shouldn't do that. Because you, you should say, God, I'm willing to wait and be patient and trust that you know me best, God. You know who I am, and you know the person that you've created me to be with, so I'm going to wait. The hard part of that is number two, the second and, and last point really tonight is this. Don't try to rush the plan. Don't try to rush the plan. And I want to point out there's in the song, uh, in your Bible, it might say Song of Solomon. Some Bibles say Song of Songs. It's the same book. Um, it was written by Solomon, and it's a, it's a poem, and it's a love poem. And it's pretty weird uh, if you read it. They give a lot of weird uh, analogies. You know, they, they um, use a lot of imagery that is not normal for us. They talk about does and gazelles and fruits, and it's, it's kind of weird. Okay, so, but in the Song of Solomon, uh, there is a phrase that is repeated three times. Once in the second chapter of the book, once in the third chapter of the book, and once in the eighth, which is the last chapter of the book. We see this running theme, and the first time we see it is Song of Songs 2-7. It says this, I adjure you, O maidens of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and by the young does of the open fields. In other words, he's, he's wanting to make, to swear by these things. And um, gazelles and does were symbols of love. So he's saying, by these things that are symbols of love in nature, I'm going to swear by these things. And this is what he wants, you, wants these maidens of Jerusalem to swear. Do not awaken or arouse love until it pleases. And then this same idea in the next chapter of Song of Songs, chapter 3, verse 5, he, uh, it writes this, I admonish you, O maidens of Jerusalem, by the gazelles and by the young does of the open fields, do not awaken or arouse love until it pleases. And then a third time, at the end of this book, in Song of Songs 8, 4, it shortens it down to this, I admonish you, O maidens of Jerusalem, do not arouse or awaken love until it pleases. So what does that even mean? Why, why does he say that three times? Simply put, it would be this. Wait for love to blossom. Don't hurry it. Wait for love to blossom. Don't hurry it. Don't try and rush the plan. You have your whole life ahead of you. Don't spin your wheels unnecessarily if it's not time. Right? So how do you put this do not disturb sign on awakening love in somebody? You, see, you make the choice that, you're going to develop friendships and have fun as friends. You can learn a lot about uh, guys. Girls are weird. Yeah. Right? No, Shaden? Come on. Amen, brother. Give me a high five on that. He said, ain't that the truth. Go uh, girls, guys are dumb. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Hayden? You know what I'm saying? That it's true. Logic. It's true. Here's, here's the thing. Guys and girls are different. We are, in fact, right now at your age, girls are generally, as a general statement, not in every case, Amen. girls are generally a lot more mature emotionally than guys. No, that's not, it, eventually you kind of, you kind of reach a point where you begin to catch up, but here's the thing, it's. I, I, I thank God that I grew up with two sisters and two brothers. And so in, in my family, I had a younger sister and I had an older sister. And I spent a lot of time with my sisters. In fact, you guys know my younger sister, Sarah, who leads worship on Sunday mornings at the Sunday Experience. Um, and so I learned a lot about how girls act and think and stuff that you just don't say to girls because it will make them break down and cry from just living with my sisters, right? Um, and I learned that my brothers like to beat me up a lot. So, you know, that's just guys are more physical. Now, Mel grew up with only sisters. So when we were friends, we're hanging out. We hung out with a whole group. I was an intern at her church. So we were always together with a group of about, I don't know, 10 of us, 
probably we would go out we would all go out to dinner together we'd all go out to her house and barbecue and jump on the trampoline and swim in the pool or we would all go on a field trip to wherever we were going to go in Detroit we all spent time together as a group and so we we got to know each other in a group if we're going to somebody's house for a birthday party we were all caravanning in cars together and so I got to know Mel without any pressure of her having to think that I was like awesome Right? I knew eventually she would learn how awesome I was. But there wasn't that pressure because we were just friends, right? Because actually when we met, we, there was kind of this uh, rule that we couldn't date because we were interns and we were there to, to be interns and not to find love. No, so um, funny story, though. Her pastor did come back after interviewing me, and he came back and said, hey, I found your husband. And then he didn't tell her which guy. There was like seven of us. And she didn't tell her which guy he said was going to be her husband, and then he flew to California and performed, gave communion to us at our wedding, and he said, Tiara was the one I picked, you know, all four years ago, he, he finally let the cat out of the bag, but anyway, I'm not, I'm not even, but here's the thing, when you put that do not disturb sign on love, you commit to say, hey, I can learn about how to interact with, with guys and girls, people of the opposite sex, in group settings, and be friends with people and have fun with people and not have any of the pressure that comes in from being in a relationship. You can practice purity, like we said last week, purity is essential by being careful how you act, how you speak towards people of the opposite sex, and you, you be careful about the things that you might even send them via a message or text message or Facebook message or Instagram or whatever you use. So why should you wait on pursuing a relationship? Because once you start down the path of pursuing relationships, it's really hard to go backwards. And I was trying to think of how I could illustrate this for you guys. And I kind of put it this way. I, I, the, parents, my, the house my parents live in right now, some of you guys have been there. Um, I lived in that house since I was two years old. And I shared a bedroom with one of my brothers for a lot of those years. When, when I got through high school, I went to college. And so I went and I lived in a dorm room for four years at the college I went to. And that dorm room was set up to where I, there was a big bedroom and there was two beds and two desks and two closets and, and I had a roommate. And then each of those sets of two was joined by a bathroom. So were four of us shared one bathroom and there was two guys in each bedroom. So we were, you know, it was cool. We had our video game section. We, we uh, hung out, we made coffee, we ate pizza. It was just cool hanging out with, in, in that dorm, I don't know how many dorms were in, our hall there's three floors of just you know so it's a bunch of guys living in this building now i went through that that was fun it was fine i enjoyed spending time with these guys that i'm friends with still today but when i graduated from college guess what i moved out of the dorm and i got my own apartment so now i had my own bedroom i had my own bathroom i had my own kitchen i had my own living room i had my own little dining nook corner it was just me and a cat for like three months, and then I decided I'm not a cat person, so I got rid of that cat. So um, then, I, like, I, I was fine in that apartment, and that's the apartment that Mel and I, um, when we got married, we she moved into my apartment, and so it was cool. It was just two of us, and then we had Gavin, and Gavin lived with us in our little one bedroom apartment for a few months, and then I took a job, and part of that job was that now I got a house. A three-bedroom, one-bathroom house. And you know what? After I moved out of that dorm, I said, I had that apartment. I, I don't want to go back to living in a dorm. Oh, that'd be crazy. I don't want to live with a bunch of dudes in a building with no kitchen. And they're nasty in the bathroom. Sharing a bathroom with that many guys is disgusting. And then I had this apartment. And it was cool. But then when I got a house, I thought, I don't want to go back to living in an apartment because now I've got my own yard, I've got my own parking space, I've got my own room, I've got more, I've got a big party room in the back, we had a pool table, and guess what, after that little house we moved into, now we have a big house, and we've got multiple bathrooms. I don't ever want to go back to a house that only has one bathroom, because sometimes I have to go to the bathroom, and somebody else is in there. One time, guys, I had to go to the bathroom when my mother-in-law was visiting, and she was in the bathtub, and I had diarrhea. <laughs> I don't want to go back to having only one bathroom option. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to go backwards because you get used to what you have right here, right now. And that's how it is in relationships. You 
are fine being single, and then if you get a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you don't want to go back to not having a boyfriend or a girlfriend. And once you hold hands, you don't want to go back to not holding hands. And once you walk with your arm around this person, you don't want to go back to not having your arm around that person because God's plan for relationships is marriage. You progress down this path, and you don't want to go backwards. So why should you wait? Because marriage is like on the other side of town right now, and you're just walking along. One day you'll get there. One day you'll get there. So what should you do if you've already been in a relationship, you've already experienced maybe the pain and heartache of having been in a relationship that you weren't quite ready for? You have to ask God to help you be patient. That's a hard thing. When you ask God for patience, he's going to work it out. You have to work on being close in your relationship with Christ. You have to develop a prayer time where you're talking to Jesus and listening to him talk to you. You have to know what the Bible says and what it means for your life and study it. You have to ask God to help you hear clearly so that when you meet the person that you're meant to spend the rest of your life with, you hear his voice. Or what if you do right now if you're in a relationship? Slow down. Put the brakes, stomp on those brakes, and slow down. Like I said, God's purpose for relationships is marriage, and you're a long way from being ready to be married. So focus more on being really good friends. Avoid situations where you might be tempted to cross lines that you know you shouldn't. Guard your purity. Don't spend time alone. Like I said, stay in group settings where you can stay accountable. Don't send anything to that other person in a text, a video, email, direct message, or anything else that you wouldn't want your grandma to see. Grandma rule. Grandma rule. Let me just say, because right now, if you guys send something that you shouldn't send, guess what that means? For right now in the state of Kansas, that means a felony charge, and for the rest of your life, you're listed on the National Register of Sex Offenders. Did you guys know that's the law right now? So you get caught sending something that is inappropriate to somebody else that is your age for the rest of your life, wherever you go, that mistake will follow you, right? So live by the grandma rule because purity is important. Purity is essential. Let me ask you this. Will you commit to waiting, waiting for God to bring the right person in your life at the right time? That's what I would ask you guys to do tonight. Let's stand together. We're going to pray for one another. I want you to join hands across this room, and we're going to pray for each other that we would um, be willing to not disturb, do not arouse or awaken love until it desires. Let's uh, join hands across this room. I want you to pray for the person on your right or your left, that God would help them to be patient, that God would help them to hear his voice. And that God would help them to guard their purity. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this opportunity tonight to look into your word. I pray that you would help each and every one of us, wherever we're at in this. Lord, some of us in this room might be in relationships. And we need to slow down. We need to put up protections around us to guard ourselves. Lord, I pray that you would help us to do that. Lord, some have been in relationships. They've been hurt by relationships. Lord, tonight I pray that you would help them to be patient and wait for you to develop a relationship that's most important, that's a relationship with you, Jesus, above anything else. Lord, I pray for those that haven't yet jumped into having a, a relationship as, as a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Lord, I pray that you would help them to hear the word tonight and be patient and be willing to wait and be willing to hear from you, Lord God, and learn how to be friends with people and develop a lot of friendships and, and lead people to you. But Lord, I pray that their focus would be on um, just staying close to you as they live life with people around them. Jesus, I pray that you'd help each and every one of us to follow you, to honor you with our lives. In Jesus' name I am.